Well, hello, I'm Paul Barclay from Big Ideas on RN here in Brisbane. It's a pleasure, as always, to be here tonight to host this third and final GOMA Talks event held in conjunction with the Harvest Exhibition at the Gallery of Modern Art. Before I proceed any further, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past and present. The Harvest Exhibition currently on display is a celebration of food in art. Over 150 works from the gallery's collection. Harvest includes some magnificent still lifes from the 17th century through to today. Contemporary photography, bold video works, dramatic large-scale installations, and it sits alongside Food on Film, a curated film series at the Australian Cinematheque at GOMA. Check it out if you haven't already. The GOMA Talks program is presented in partnership between Quagoma and ABC Radio National. It spans three sessions exploring food, its production, consumption and symbolism in contemporary life. And this is the final in the series. But you can find video of each session on the gallery's website and versions of these talks can be found also on the RN website, including this one we're about to have, which will be broadcast on Monday, August the 11th at 8 p.m. on Big Ideas on RN, or you can podcast it. Tonight's session is loosely titled The Politics of Food, but will probably be just as much about the place of food in contemporary culture and its relationship to health, or should I say, poor health. You'd think that judging by the contemporary cultural landscape that Australians are obsessed with food. Cookbooks, cooking shows, fancy new restaurants, providors and farmers markets proliferate. The affluent middle class has embraced everything from organic food to the elite foodie culture, such as the 15 course degustation by the celebrity chef. Uh, paradoxically though, much of the food we actually eat is public enemy number one, contributing to the epidemic of modern lifestyle diseases that are afflicting us. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and so on. We are eating, especially our kids, way too much of the wrong food. The highly processed stuff, the junk food, take away the stuff high in saturated fat, salt, and sugar. The stuff that's often cheap and perhaps this adds to the appeal. There is, of course, no shortage of nutritional food out there, but uh, clearly not everyone is the beneficiary of it. As I said, maybe it's because it's too expensive, maybe it's because people prefer potato chips to broccoli. Um, then there's the question of where our food comes from, how and where it's produced. Sustainability is becoming more of a priority as environmental imperatives like climate change, depletion of fish stocks and other factors come to the fore. Do we know enough about where our food comes from? Do we care? Uh, despite the MasterChef craze, how many of us actually know how to cook a decent nutritional meal? And uh, you have to wonder about the growth of cheap takeaway outlets and restaurants where it seems we were getting much of our food from. Plenty of talk about, to talk about on this discussion. Don't forget GOMA Talks is interactive. You can take part in the discussion if you're here in the audience or if you're watching via the live stream. Just tweet your comments and questions to the hashtag GOMA Talks or SMS 0488 Talks and we'll try and include some of your perspectives as we work our way through the discussion. Let me introduce, with no further avail, my uh, guests for this evening, on my immediate right, Dr. Diane Condon Paoloni, Honorary Fellow at the School of Health Sciences at the University of Wollongong. I hope I got your surname right there, Diane. Yes, you did. Um, immediately <laughs> next to Diane is Richard Webb, an expert on sustainable fishing, but you might know him as the owner of Swamp Dog Fish and Chips, just around the corner in West End. Next to Richard, we have Dr. Jim Hyde, Professor of Public Health Policy at Deakin University, and Jim's had a number of senior jobs in the public sector in this field as well. And we're also joined tonight by Dee Madigan, Creative Director of Madigan Communications, joining us via Skype 
because we are so thoroughly modern here at GOMA. Hello to Dee. Hi. Uh, please make our guests welcome tonight. <laughs> Jim, I'm going to come to you first of all. Um, you've been involved in public health policy for eons in uh, high level public sector jobs yeah, as an academic. I admit. Have we as a society become addicted to crap food? We have, but what we've become addicted to is, sorry about this D, is advertising. <laughs> and, um, and to a large extent, we believe what we're told rather than we believe what we know. So most people will, would know that it's better to have fresh food than it is to have a chocolate biscuit. But put the chocolate biscuit out with the apple and see what they go for. Mm. And you put that down entirely to advertising and marketing, do you? Well, I think advertising's got a fair bit to do with it because advertising, advertising is a client of food manufacturing and there's a symbiotic relationship between the two now. And so uh, food manufacturing uh, companies believe that if you, can, if you can process food and you can deconstruct food and make more products out of it, that's better for the economy, which it might well be. But you know, I used to say to the former Premier of Victoria all the time, it's not better to have another McRobertson's chocolate factory in Victoria than it is to have sustainable food. Mm. It's better to argue that we should have a green food um, sector rather than a... But we're making the choices, Jim, and surely we're not thinking that the Mars well, bar actually, is better than the carrot. We're not actually making the choices. We're, we're basically told what to choose, and we do what we're told pretty much. Before I go any further, and I'm sure Dee would like to respond to some of that, just give us an idea, a, a, a brief thumbnail sketch of the impact that this consumption of bad food is having on our health as a society. Well, the impact is that it is, as you said in the introduction, the, the growth of the so-called lifestyle diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke and so on. And they are directly attributable to a highly increased rate of salt, which we're addicted to the taste of salt, a highly increased rate of sugar in its various forms, either sucrose or fructose in particular, and, and we're pretty well addicted to those as well. Mm. Um, and saturated fats, which you know are directly implicated in um, in the metabolic syndrome and therefore in diabetes. And so uh, we are, we really are eating ourselves not to to life but to death. And, uh, and you've only got to look at the obesity numbers in the, in the community and, you know, there's all this nonsense about, oh, there's healthy, healthy at any weight. You know, I don't, I don't ascribe to that argument at all. I think weight is the thing that we should be arguing against. Anybody who thinks they're healthy at any weight, especially if they're obese, is kidding themselves. And, um, and they just need to, to uh, take a reality check. Deanne, if I can bring you into yeah. the discussion, um, Jim's pretty clear on where he sees most of the blame for the poor eating habits that we've become accustomed to. Do you, do you agree with him that the, the industry and also the, the marketing around that industry has helped to create these bad habits that are really causing massive health problems? I partially agree. I think the marketing of, of food is a very important influence on what people eat. It's also an important influence on what is available to them to eat, so that it's not just the direct marketing and the messages that are being sent out into the community, but the big food companies, for instance, are paying for space on shelves and for location on shelves so that um, the availability of what you're purchasing is actually triggered by where it's located mm. on supermarket shelves. So it's not just messages that are going out there, but the availability Shopping of psychology particular... psychology is big business. It's it is. It's the subtleties big. of the placement. The subtleties of placement. placement and product placement. In, if you go into, in a, res into a supermarket, and have a look and see what side the bad food is. It's always on your left. You, you go in on the right. On the left, there are uh, product placements, and they're always at a point where you can take mm. them easily and they, and they catch your eye. Mm. But, I mean, there's also issues around um, the number of hours that people work. We no longer work a, a reasonable work day. We, you know, men and women work very long hours in 
a huge range of, of jobs and that leaves less time. So we're looking for, for convenience foods. So we're looking for foods that are convenient. And it's rational. If you, know, if you live in an outer suburb and you've got three or four kids who are latchkey kids after school and you've got to get home and feed them, you know, it's quicker and cheaper to drop off at um, a fast food outlet in many times and to then, um, and then pick up a family pack and take them home and feed them. Because one, you'll know that the kids will eat it. There'll be no fight, you'll get them to bed quicker. And secondly, you won't have to do all that cleaning up. Mm. It's Dee, a rational let, choice. I understand why people make it. It's let me come to you, Dee. Uh, how much of the blame should the advertising industry and the marketers and their uh, associated uh, food industry clients, how much of the blame should they take for the mess we've gotten ourselves in? Uh, some, but certainly not all. Um, I think advertising is a very soft target for blame because people hate advertising and often for, for a lot of really good reasons. But the fact is you can only advertise what products there are. So it's the companies that create these quite terrible foods often and then go to the advertisers to sell them. So advertising is kind of secondary down down the track, you know, and, and I, we see it all the time with um, people who sort of say, well, it's junk food ads that are making us fat. It's like, it could be the four hours you're spending in front of the TV every night. <laughs> you know? There are a whole host of with reasons, a bag of, of, chips. Which, mm. of which advertising is one, but is certainly not the main cause of it. Um, I do think that a lot of the causes um, are, the, are the products themselves. For example, if you look at diet products, that, that's what they used to sell. That was the big selling point for 20 years until people realised they were reducing the carbs by upping the sugar. Mm. And going back to your point about, you know, uh, an apple and a Tim Tam, the people choosing the Tim Tam, that's not the advertising. That's our addiction to sugar. It's quite a physical thing that is making us choose the Tim Tam. You can't blame ads for everything. Yeah, I really, I really do wonder who these people are out there who are thinking honestly that the Tim Tam is as good for them as the apple. I mean, clearly, surely we know that this food, even though we're enjoying it in the moment, is not doing us any good, especially if we're consuming it in copious volumes. But they're not thinking that it's better for them. What they're thinking is evolutionarily. Their brain, their brain knows from evolution that if you're hungry, you need high-density food. Mm -hmm. And so if, if, you, if you're advertised hunger, which is in fact what you are advertised a lot of the time, then you will look for high-density food. And the best way to not get high-density food is not to put it in your cupboards in the first place. So you, you parents out there should keep those high-density foods out of the cupboard and you know, have the... Um, I understand that's the case especially the with kids, thing. but isn't there a point in which the information oh, that you have... D wants you. She doesn't like something I've said again. Oh, no, not at all, not at all. I actually agree with you. I think the problem is we're so used to foods with sugar that we continually crave it. So you're right. If we remove those kind of foods from your body for a couple of days, you actually do stop craving them. But it is being conscious of what we're putting into our body and knowing that that is actually having a metabolic effect on the choices we're making. Okay. So, Jim, what you think needs to happen is that governments need to intervene because we can't look after ourselves, government needs to look after ourselves well, I for don't us. see it much different to um, other, other behaviours that are hard for people to individually control because of addictions and things like that. And I actually think we, I mean, it's like cigarettes, really. We ought to, we ought to just say, well, we know what works. Pricing signals work really, really well. We've got we tax, tax crappy food. I would tax sugar content and salt content. And I'd tax alcohol volume. That's right. That's you you agree, Dianne? I agree. Um, there have been lots of studies in lots of areas that show that people are very price conscious and they will actually adjust to it or choose a different product if if in but fact the price goes up, and that's true with chefs. alcohol. I have no, to say, no. we, we have, we have, a, a, we have a fish and chip shop proprietor <laughs> here who's looking rather bemused at all of this. Uh, do you go easy on the salt, Richard, at your place? No, no look, <laughs> I'm into enjoying stuff. Yeah. But what, what, well, as, as someone in the, in the food sort of industry, what's, what's your response to taxing certain foods to discourage consumption? Yeah, I, look, I agree, I, and, and I completely agree with you that we actually are designed to pull out, you know, if it's got a lot of fat and it's got a lot of sugar. That's what we want. You don't want it because someone taught you to, though, I don't think. I think you took it because it wasn't freely available when you were walking on the savannah, mm. and you're going to put as much away as you can when you can get it. Mm. Unfortunately, now we've got heaps at our disposal. And so sending the price signal will inherently discourage people from 
eating this food because but we it do becomes... teach we teach kids to do it because you've ever been to a school canteen yes i have and seen it's the not, not a pleasant sight canteen. actually is it you know you've got all these schools with them um, with kitchen gardens outside rotting and all this it's rubbish in the true. school canteen yeah. instead of yeah. Um, yeah. not true instead of organizing we, we, we the mothers will... to have a cooking <laughs> class and feed the kids at lunchtime yeah. do you know that i've done those cooking classes and made pizzas with the kids out of and they love it. They do. They do love it. <laughs> and they when do. I actually was part of a process once where we, we taught mothers at a local school to cook and gave them certificates so they'd go and get jobs in local aged care facilities and things as a cook. Here's Dee waving her hands again. So, Dee. And then we, and we fed the kids at lunchtime and, you know, they got dumped because it wasn't up to schools to feed children. OK, D. Can we stop saying can we teach the mothers because I'm pretty sure kids have yeah. two yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Feed the par teach the parents. The yeah. <laughs> Guess what, whoever that was. Teach, teach the, the fathers, fathers we're getting yelled at us from the audience, The fathers are not D. looking after the kids. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they, yeah well, some of us were. I did, but, yeah. the, but most... Um, let's, most hear more, let's hear more from Dee. Dee? I, I find that incredibly... Not a, I'm not going to say offensive because I hate that word, but honestly, my husband's just as responsible for my children's um, nutritional intake as I am, as are most fathers, I know, so that sort of... You know, teach the mothers thing is just absurd. Most school canteens now are actually very, very health conscious. I know ours is as well, and involves the parents, both of them, mothers and fathers. Okay, let's come to this issue of. Um, I was going to come to this later, but we'll come to it now, seeing as it's been brought up. These school kitchen gardens, Deanne. I mean. Um, the idea was that we had bred a generation of kids who didn't know where their food came from, didn't know what to do with it, didn't know how it was grown, and uh, so they were disconnected. And uh, Stephanie Alexander, she's not the only one, but she came up with this scheme, these kitchen gardens at schools where kids would grow the vegetables, they'd see how they were grown, they'd then pull the vegetables out and prepare a meal with them. How useful have these programs been? Because you've, I think you've actually yeah. evaluated Stephanie's uh, scheme. Yes. Um, we, I was a member of a team that evaluated the scheme nationwide for the Stephanie Alexander Kitchen Garden Program. Um, we uh, sampled a wide variety of schools, urban schools, rural schools, remote schools, small schools, large schools, schools in disadvantaged areas, schools in advantaged areas. And um, it was, I guess, one of the key findings about that was that teaching children to cook um, had, did have a positive impact on their willingness to try new foods. Um, and a large number of children reported they would always try a new food, which was very different from our comparison schools. Um, they particularly would try foods that they'd grown and they particularly would try foods that they cooked. But it also had a further impact in that parents reported that their children, or 75% of parents reported their children asked to cook at home what they'd cooked at school and they were more willing to cook at, at home. Mm. Um, we weren't able to demonstrate any impact on their actual food choices, but they did report, for instance, eating a wider variety of foods. So we, none of the... So um, it helped create a bit more curiosity so it, about it the... It created a curiosity about food, about a willingness to particularly eat vegetables, which... Um, but systemically, um, we did nothing from the Seventy Alexander mm -hmm. Kitchen Gardens to actually make a move from taking the food out of the kitchen gardens and into the school and have a learning process goes on that changes the system. Our, our problem basically is our system is broken. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by that because the schools all had different ways that they used the produce from the garden. So some schools used them in the kitchen. The children prepared a meal. The children ate the meal all together. But some schools, as well as doing that, actually use the produce from the garden in their canteen lunches and reported that in fact on those days where produce from the garden was um, part of the canteen lunch, that sales went up, not down. I've got an interesting tweet. Sitting in the audience and we run an incredibly successful school kitchen garden which is certainly not rotting. 
<laughs> good to hear. Uh, Richard, well, I'm pleased to hear well, that. <laughs> Richard, uh, you're a chef. Do you yeah. think that we have brought up a generation of kids who don't have sufficient, notwithstanding the success of these schemes, perhaps, that don't have sufficient food preparation and food knowledge? Uh, look, yeah, I think that's undoubtedly true. I was, I was wondering, my wife's here somewhere, I was wondering if that's her. <laughs> Maybe she's it's a, her tweet. Well, she's a school <laughs> principal and she uh -huh. has a, a, a veggie garden and, and mm. that's where I get occasion to go and cook with the kids. But I think exactly what you say, those kids are all over it. They're loving it and lining up for more and eating their cos lettuce. And, mm. you know, like, you like a lettuce more that you grew yourself. You don't really. Actually, you don't. But you're connected to it and you've got a bit of provenance about it. It does and seem to taste better, it though, does. doesn't it? Well, it's like true it's what right. they say about homegrown tomatoes. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, making your own pesto out of the basil, that, something as simple as that out of the yeah. basil that you've grown in your backyard is yeah. so much better than buying, especially yeah. buying pre-made stuff. Yeah, but there's a trick in that. It's not really. You're just more connected to it. It might be, but actually, really, the bigger picture is that you've just got more experience with that food than putting it in your mouth. Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll come to talk a bit more about sustainability in a moment, but Deanna, I just wanted to, unless, Dee, you've got anything you'd like to add to that, I was pleased to hear from your experience, because it's been so long since I admit my kids were in primary school, I'm pleased to hear that uh, primary school canteens seem to have changed from oh. your experience at least anyway. Oh, massively, massively. Oh, you almost feel a little bit sorry for the kids, there's no treats. <laughs> <laughs> no Coke, no potato chips. Oh, no. hell no, nothing no. like that. They've got some rice pop things. Okay. <laughs> Stuck on homemade muesli bars, are they? <laughs> uh, Deanne, we, we do talk a lot about in our culture, sort of designer food and expensive food and beautiful cookbooks and farmers markets and so on. But the brutal reality is that there are a substantial number of disadvantaged Australians who actually run out of food every week. Yes, uh, on our very most simple measure, which is a question that occurs on um, some of the national surveys at very long intervals, 5% of Australians report that they ran out of food and did not have enough to buy more in the last 12 months. That's a million people mm -hmm. who actually don't have sufficient money to buy food. And that, I, I can see a few tweets about the fact that if we tax uh, high fat, high sugar, uh, high salt foods, we may in fact be taxing the poor, that it would be yep. regressive. And what is your response to that? And the, the truth is that for many people on low incomes, kilojoules come in the form of high sugar, high fat yep. foods, and it makes sense for them to purchase those kind of foods so that the family has a certain level of satiety in response to their foods. That's a really bad thing. Mm. I mean, that's a, a really bad thing that it's better for people to buy unhealthy foods. High salt, two high minute salt, noodles, for example. Yes, but if, because I that's mean, I what think they if can you, afford. If you go to the argument about the socioeconomic status of people yep. and taxation mm. and the regression of taxation, people used to argue that about tobacco all the time, but the fact is, if you want to kill the poor, go right ahead and do so, but don't involve me in it. You know, I just don't think we should be doing things that um, we know are harmful when we've got ways to overcome that. Yeah. Is the difference not, though, that there is no safe level of tobacco smoking, whereas you can eat some of this poor food in small amounts and it won't do you a great deal of harm? A few, blocks of, few bits of chocolate every now and then are not going to kill that's you. That's the argument of the food industry. This is the, uh, the food that you've been, you've been got out by the food industry. <laughs> and that the issue basically is addiction. The fact is we're addicted to salt and sugar. Mm. I mean, the, the real response or the appropriate response is actually income policies that ensure that people have enough food. If you look at the, um, if you look at systemically at the, in the United States, there's this thing called the International Life Sciences mm -hmm. Institute or something like that. It's a lobby group for the food industry, which is owned by the food industry, the tobacco industry and the pharmaceutical industry. And it, um, it, it includes all the big food manufacturers mm -hmm. like Monsanto and people like that who are the supposed baddies in GM food and so on. But they're all working together and they all cross own each other's businesses. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you really have to think systemically about this and... Dee, what do you think about taxing 
junk food to deter consumption of it? I think Deanne makes a really good point that we need to be very, very careful that we don't hurt the poor people. And I know that Kim's point is, well, junk food is hurting them, and he's quite right. But really, it comes down to I'd educating not people. Kill them. Yeah, I know that. But ultimately, a lot of times people buy junk food because they feel very they don't have the confidence to cook fresh food. So I think we need to start now with our children, which we are doing with these market gardenings gardens and things like that. Hopefully they will grow up to be more confident with their food. Meanwhile, we can't just start taxing a whole lot of people in their 30s and 40s who don't have that education or confidence and start making them pay more for food. I just don't... I think it's just going to hurt people more than it needs to. Got a question here from a tweet. What about the economic costs of bad food on the health system? Uh, we've spoken about health, but obviously if people are getting unhealthier and getting chronic conditions because of the food they eat, that places... Uh, obviously a cost burden on the health system, and they're saying is education uh, and relying on the school curriculum enough? Um, do we, and I, and I, think, I think we've probably actually answered that to the extent that it's not enough and we need other measures. I don't think it's enough. I think uh, most, most evaluations of things that are done through schools don't turn out to be actually very good evaluations because we expect schools to do things... <laughs> The, the results turn out to be very good. The evaluations are right, but the results don't generally turn out to be very good because we expect schools to do things that they're not there to do. Schools are not there to do these things. Schools are there basically to provide good, strong, basic education to kids and, or for child mind, one of the two. And, um, and we... Uh, I'm just going to be a bit provocative. <laughs> and, we, um, and we really need to think about what are we asking teachers to do and, you know, just how much can you cram into the general curriculum. You're better off designing systemically ways in which things can happen much more easily. Mm. And I think that is the way that we've been moving in the past few years to try and get things like... And the idea of a, of a kitchen garden in a school and then having a systemic approach to a school kitchen, but not very many schools have a restaurant standard kitchen, mm. and they should have. It should be part of the I process. want to move on to sustainability and bring, bring Richard into yeah. the discussion more. Richard, you're a chef, you're a fisher, you run a sustainable fish and chip shop. You also work with the Australian Marine Conservation Foundation, so you know a, a bit about the industry side of uh, cooking and preparing and selling food, but you also are finding more and more out about our fish stocks and how depleted they're getting. Sure. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty ugly seen out there at the moment, I understand. Our fish stocks are badly depleted. Oh, so look, that's a really tricky, complicated question. Um, no, I don't think so. I think no? Australia's fisheries are generally in reasonable condition. I think there's certainly many issues within there. He won't let me eat orange uh, ruffy. That's no, he eats orange ruffy. Oh, well, that, that, that leads not. me to the next ah. question then. Are, are we, I said are I we, like it, but I don't yeah. Are we eating the wrong fish? Yeah, often. And just a small bandwidth of... Look, if you go to a restaurant, you already know before you walk in the door out of five or six fish what's going to be on the menu. I can tell you, salmon, swordfish, you know. And that's one of the things, they, is that we eat a really small kind of bandwidth, if you like. There's another thing in that too, that we like the high order. We like the, we like the, the, the top end predators, the apex predators, and you know, in my, in, not in mine, but in, in a fish and ship shop anywhere in this country, you're going to get flack, you know? Mm. A fish like a shark only has a couple of babies. It's not, it, it's a high order predator. You know what? Evolution doesn't need to make you resilient to a high level of predation, but then we come along and bang them on the head. Mm. So there are just some fish that aren't designed for it, or a 130 year old fish in the deepest, darkest ocean that lives for 130 years old. There's lots of health reasons mm. that you shouldn't eat those fish too, you know? Hey, 130 years, you can suck a lot of mercury out of the ocean. And, mm. and if you're at the top of the food chain, ditto. You could. Yeah, so there's lots of... Look, I've heard a lot of these arguments before. The difference is that you're trying to run, well, you are running a business along these sustainability sure. lines. That's, that's the big difference. How have you managed or tried to practice sustainability in your business in terms of the fish that you choose to serve and indeed where do you get yeah. enough of this fish from? Every chef wants to have something that they're into and you need your point of difference. It's not that hard. It's not that, you know, people ask me that all the time. You know what? It's not that hard. What was really hard was the journey on how to get hold of those fish. Mm. But I had a few leg ups and those kinds of things early on. 
Um, and what are those fish, we should say? If it's not Atlantic salmon, what, what, what are we talking about? Well, look, I wouldn't say that, that it's not Atlantic salmon. I would say that I would have a better choice. Mm -hmm. um, for me, if I'm going to take two kilos of wild-caught fish and stir in some chicken blood and a bit of soy and all the rest of it and produce one kilo of salmon, well, that's not on the cards for me. I wouldn't say that it's not. And, hey, look, every now and then I'll eat a bit. But um, for me, it's for, like if your rules of thumb are further down the food chain, yep. there are some fish eminently suited to aquaculture, barramundi being one of them. It's a, a one for one. That means if I have catch one kilo of wild-caught fish, I'm going to be able to produce one kilo of barramundi with that. There's other new fish that you'll see more and more, covia and, and those. Aquaculture is lifting its game, and it's really going to start filling that void that we have where we're because fish really is the last wild animal that we're eating in a mass amount but your basic philosophy is trying to keep it as close as possible to local and as close as possible well, that, to sustainable yeah. and what you're doing is you're getting people to eat fish that was extremely unfashionable and perhaps still is unfashionable sure, sure. morton bay mullet for for example and in the 60s mullet was the most popularly consumed fish in the country and, you know, the day I opened the door, an old crusty guy walked in and said, you're going to be selling mullet, mate? <laughs> <laughs> and I, at that point, I, I wasn't around it. I was thinking, oh, I don't know if this is going to work out. And then, you know, as it happened, a fisherman rang me and said, hey, you want some mullet? Mm. And it's not the terrible red. There's reasons for that. I could bore you with it. But most of the mullet that hits the market is actually caught for Bataga. Right, the row that we all want to grate on our pasta and you will pay 70 bucks a kilo for. When you're catching a fish, a mullet for... A, Row, you don't have to chill it, you don't have to do much to it. So, but there's this massive byproduct of not well looked after flesh that you can go down to Woolies tomorrow and buy it for seven bucks a kilo. And I suppose two things where do you get enough of it to service your business? And secondly, how do you change consumer preference to purchase that instead of the the yeah. snapper or the flake? Or well, I'm pretty good at whatever. that, I'm pretty good at trying <laughs> you to eat something else. Um, and I'm just a bit cheeky. But with carp it, really. is an example of that, isn't it? Because carp, you know, which is a really bony, nasty fish, according to most Europeans, is a core um, a core ingredient in some Asian dishes. Yeah. And Asian people eat carp out of the rivers all the time. We we've got them swimming around sure. in the Murray. A delicacy, in fact, at yeah, some yeah. expensive Asian restaurants. And yeah. we have them running around, swimming around in the Murray, killing off Murray cod, and, mm. we, um, and we won't eat them. They go into cat food. Do you know what? That's a misnomer. There were much more Murray cod after the carp came. Because, hey, new food yeah. and goldfish. But still, yes, they root around the bottom and they've destroyed the... But, yeah, I... I um, <laughs> Sorry. I've seen those, I've I'm seen those big... I've seen those, I've seen those big Murray cod. Yeah, yeah. Now you live on car. Hey, Dee, can I come to you? I wonder what the marketing opportunities are for, uh, for sustainability, not just of fish, but sustainability of food generally. Is this, a, is this a market where there's enough consumer demand for you know, the industry to, to capitalise on that? Only with an education campaign. Fish is a little bit like pork where the confidence of the consumer is pretty low when it comes to cooking fish and, and particularly with fish they haven't heard of, so the, which is why people just stick with the stuff that they know that they've always gone, grown up with, which is why people keep going back to the flakes and things like that. So unless, there is, um, unless the fisheries get together for a good marketing campaign, they'd probably struggle to get people to buy fish outside their comfort zone. So is that why you see it pretty much every supermarket that has the little section that sells the fish and it, in fact at most mainstream fishmongers you see pretty much the same fish on sale everywhere you go. They're, ju they're just um, giving whatever the demand is they're supplying it. It, it, it takes a lot of confidence for um, a industry to try to create demand. For them it's just a lot easier just to supply the demand that's already there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and just another um, tweet that's come through. Locally caught fish over Atlantic salmon means less food miles for starters. And food miles is a part of your thinking too, Richard, isn't sure, it? Sure, sure. And if you're buying a fresh fish like uh, Atlantic salmon, about 75% about of it's coming from Tassie. The rest of it's coming from New Zealand and it's coming in a poly box on a plane. So, yeah, it's the worst kind of food miles. Are you finding that your in fact, educating other chefs about this, this journey sure, that sure. you've been on. And yep. So it's not easy to buy sustainable fish, or at least in the beginning it's not easy to buy sustainable fish. 
And when I decide, or more sustainable fish, I'll say, I don't like that sustainable word. If we're going to, you know, when I, when I started doing it, I learned a lot of lessons and I got a year or so into Swamp Dog and thought, you know what, I wish I had known this when I had a restaurant. Mm. And um, it just kind of put the word out, actually, and said, come on, I'll, I'll mm. show you what I learned. And mm. it's really, in fact, I, you know, there's certainly a change in... I've got a thing, right? If I go to Brisbane and have dinner, there's every chance I'm going to get salmon or Tassie lobster or something offered to me in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. And if I went to Tassie and they gave me barrow mud crabs, you know, like... It, it, <laughs> Where's my food identity, mm. you know? It's somewhere else. Yeah. And what I want to see is my local fish, my local produce, you know, more than fish, but, but certainly in my case, my local produce yep. represented in my Makes sense. Home. Uh, Deanne, is sustainability also... <laughs> I know you're interested in food security. Is sustainability yeah. a food security issue as well? Oh, it must, absolutely. Obviously. I mean, if you look at the national and global level, I mean, the most important thing about sustainability is that we utilise resources today in a way that's not going to affect the capacity of future generations to have access to those resources. And, of course, food um, is involved with a huge number of sustainability issues in relation to water. I mean, water av av availability is, go is a problem for Australia already, but it's going to become even more a global issue um, when, with, with climate change. When we look at the availability of agricultural land, um, the huge... Of course, we more than 50% of the world's population now lives in cities, and they're expanding mm. over much agricultural land that once produced the food for a much smaller-sized city. So we're, we're talking... Water, we're talking available land, uh, uh, increasing desiccation of some important agricultural areas in Australia and uh, overseas. Um, so we really need to think about sustainability in relation to our food. I, I tell and you the difficulty, Richard, with mm. buying, even beginning to sort of work your way through this area of buying sustainable fish. The the baffling nature of A, knowing which fish is sustainable, but then the branding or the naming of fish. Sure. So many fish in Australia have more than one name. It's, it's hard to even know yeah. what you're buying yeah. or what its provenance yeah. is. I, you, you're absolutely right. And so, what can I tell you to do with that? Yeah, look, it's a hard one. So, A, you've got to trust your fishmonger. You can get a I'm about to start working yes, with them, but you can get a little booklet from the AMCS. Yeah, and a sustainable yeah, labelling yeah. type. And it's yeah. not going to solve your problems. However, it's a point to start. Look, my journey with trying to source more, more sustainable seafood was really what's worked for me is to have a whole lot of conversations. And every time I have a conversation, I learn something. Mm. And so all I say to people is go to your fishmonger and ask them, you know, hey, they may not have the answer, but what they know is they got the heads up and know, well, sooner or later I'm going to have to get that answer. Yeah. And then it, the more people you talk to, and you, maybe you're going to run across somebody who's a little bit more informed and give you a little bit more information, and you're going to feed it back at them and everyone's going to end up a bit more informed. Mm. It's a hard but one. I was just yeah. going to say, and more generally, um, we've done some work talking to people about issues around local food and localisation. And um, what people are definitely calling for labelling of food, the, the mm. source of food. Mm. We, so we, you yeah. go to, in some European countries, you go to your local produce market and it tells you, there's a sign that says these are from Sicily, or these are from Tuscany, or these are from and I Kenya. I think there's some really bad examples California. of why we need that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we had a, um, in Victoria, when I was Director of Public Health there, we had a quite serious outbreak of salmonella poisoning, mm -hmm. which turned out to be in sun-dried tomatoes, or semi-dried tomatoes, mm -hmm. not sun-dried tomatoes. And we could not trace the, we could not trace the provenance of the semi-dried tomatoes. Oh, really? They were either from Turkey, or they were from from um, France, or they were from Australia. Nobody quite knew where because they were all brought in and they're just all thrown in the same vats. Yeah, 
That's crazy. Whatever, so all that salmonella that's in them just breeds up in the back. They don't care whether they were Australian ones or Turkish ones or French ones. Getting and eventually, people died. Mm. Yeah. We're getting a heap of tweets here. Should the discussion include the politics of water to produce food? I'm sure it should, Absolutely. but I'm not sure we're going to have time to get to it. But thank you for raising <laughs> yes, it. Um, it. It is water. Very, very valid. Uh, we're so lucky to have an incredible variety of fish in Australia. We should be adventurous. We should eat local. Well, I think that sure, Richard yeah. would agree. Uh, go to a local fishmonger instead of a supermarket and ask where the fish came from. Um, all good suggestions. Let's let's talk about how our food is labelled now, Jim. You attempted some time ago to introduce food menu labelling in, in Victoria. In Victoria. Didn't you? We introduced a scheme. We, we developed a scheme for putting onto fast food outlets or certain fast food outlets, those with more than a certain number of outlets. But that meant all the big chains, calorie counters on their menus. We introduced, we, we moved for the introduction, it was accepted by the then government who then got defeated. But in the meantime, the New South Wales government picked up the exact same scheme and the New South Wales now got it. So you can walk into a fast food outlet in New, in New South Wales and look up there and you'll see this hamburger has this many kilojoules in it and so on. It actually has changed the way that people buy because they go, ooh. perhaps I shouldn't. I'd like to see it labelled with salt. In fact, I'd like to see the traffic light system on it that said, you know, it's yeah. high in salt, high in fat, high in, high in saturated fat, high in, in uh, sugar. And, you know, but people, can under, people understand the traffic lights. If they didn't understand the traffic lights, they'd all be dead in, the, in their cars, wouldn't they? Did, did the and, uh, food industry put up a bit of a fight? The over food the industry yes, put up a disgraceful food. fight. I used, to have the, I used to have the managing director of all the big food chains in my office all the time yelling at me about how you know, what we were doing was really wrong. And they would bring, they would bring nutritionists for sale in <laughs> with them, who would then give me these great big arguments about why we shouldn't, shouldn't do that. Uh, Dee, I think, wants to come in on that. And I was going to ask you, but feel free to add to this, I was going to ask you, Dee, how powerful is, is the, the food industry? They've got plenty of money to spend to get their message across. Well, and what was terrible was that whole traffic light thing was dropped because one of the guys in the minister's office or, or one of the ministers responsible was actually a food lobbyist and that wasn't even, um, you know, disclosed, which is just a disgrace. Well, the food was, lobby has an enormous amount of... In the, um, in the, that's what happened in the federal minister's office yes, when, yeah. when the labelling yeah. was dropped. But in the um, state the, minister's office in Victoria, one of the advisers went off to work for the back, tobacco companies immediately after the election. <laughs> Yes, well, you know, I just uh, rolled the my problem eyes. with labelling, I think, particularly in the country of origin, is it's very unclear. If you get a can of tomatoes, it might look like, it might say product of Australia, and it's not until you leave, read the fine print that you realise some of it isn't from Australia at all, but because it's processed here, hmm. it's called Australian. So, so for me, I think as much information, as much clear information on the packaging would be good. There's no point with the ingredients putting a whole lot of chemicals that people don't understand. Um, you know, put what is actually in there in clear English that people can understand, put where it came from in clear English. Funnily enough, it was the advertisers that argued against that. The advertisers yes, all said, advertiser. us, oh, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that because so, it costs so much to change the labels. And I used to say, Shrek used to come out and used to change the label and put a Shrek on the front of a, of a product what's, all what's the sort time. Of what sort of information, do would you like to see on, on our package, especially our packaged foods, I suppose, the stuff you buy at the supermarket? I, I think um, Jim is quite right. I think it should have exactly how much salt is on there and also what percentage of salt that is according to your da daily intake. But at the moment, they're buried in these tiny little tables that are very, very difficult to read. So pull out the stuff that actually matters, the salt, the sugar, the fat, the, the carbs, the type of carbs. The, you know, Instead of just putting a whole lot of things there, because what happens is people literally look at all that information, it is too much for them to take in and they look away. Mm. No, that's why we need a simple method and that's, yep. why, uh, that's why I support traffic, traffic lights because the traffic lights is really simple. It says red means this is overladen with, the top red means this is overladen with saturated fat. The next red means this is overladen with, overladen with fat generally. The next one says overladen with sugar and the next one says overladen with salt. People see four reds, they'll go, we're not going to buy that and guess mm. what? The food manufacturers don't want to put it, like on, it. Their, on their yeah. can because, um, or their packet because they're not going to be able to sell that. They're going to have all these unsold things. This but in fact, the, the, um, what's happened where food labelling like this has gone in overseas is that people do buy all the, some of the all reds because they make decisions for themselves about, hmm, okay, this is where choice really does come into it. You know, people are always arguing people should have choice. Well, give them the choice. I'm not a great believer in it personally, but... 
They yep. need it. You're on, Dee. <laughs> okay, there's also a lot of politics in terms of what is bad and good, and I'm bringing up again the low-fat, you know, thing from the 70s. It's like, oh, well, this food is low-fat, and then we realise that low-fat isn't necessarily a good thing. So the lobbying that goes on in the government to sort of say, well, my, my ingredient's not bad, salt's not as bad as sugar, and you literally have wars as to which is least bad. Mm. Yeah. Not hard. It's not, that's not actually hard to work out with epidemiological studies, though. Yeah, governments yeah. are never driven by those. They're but driven you get to, by you get the lobbyists. But like the likes of me were, I could just never convince the politicians. But a good example, <laughs> Jimmy, is Coke versus orange juice. Both are high in sugar. Both, if you consume a large amount of it, are particularly bad. But, uh, I mean, comparing you know, something that's made out of fresh fruit with something that's sort of produced, mass-produced in a... Um, well, orange juice is not made out of fresh fruit, gen fruit generally. <laughs> orange juice is well, you do it, made out of that. all sorts of things, including sugar. Maybe the labelling on my orange juice is telling me fibs then. My, my, yeah. like, well, it is probably. Yeah. You wouldn't yeah. want to go and search that one out too. <laughs> but in fact, if you actually break down by, um, by the, uh, the content of things and, and, and give people the... I'd like to do some social marketing, some advertising with Dee about... What, what was actually in there when you actually analysed it. And you will see the same amount of sugar in some fruit juices that there are in Coke. Mm. And yet parents still go on giving their kids fruit juices, and rightly so, because, they, because they've been told they need two pieces of fruit a day and all this sort of, you know, all this sort of stuff. And they, so they think, oh, that's going to be healthy. It's fruit. That's a good piece of advice. Well, Don't eat anything your grandmother wouldn't recognise. Um, <laughs> and uh, Shop on the outside of the shop aisles. That's true. If you walk into a supermarket and you walk the perimeter, that's where you're likely to find the best yeah. food. Um, all the stuff in the middle, stay right away from the breakfast cereal aisle, I can tell you. But that's a disaster yeah. area. Instead of drinking the juice, it'd be better if you ate the orange. It would be. <laughs> yeah. that's, but that is, that is the, the reconstitution of food, which is which is actually an economically viable thing, and food manufacturers love it because they make more profit out of reconstituting food. Mm. Mm. You, you know, yes. if you can sell the apple peel and the apple and the apple core separately, that's, you'll get more money for that than if you sell the apple. Mm -hmm. The other thing about food labelling, actually I have to say, for my sins, I hosted a national talkback program for about over five years, and this issue of food labelling is something that people are just so passionate about. I mean, if it was up to them, the whole label would be information <laughs> and there'd be no branding on it at all. People can't get enough information. But Deanne, the thing about food labelling information is that it's only useful if it can be trusted, and it can be only trusted if someone is monitoring and, and, and enforcing the claims that are made on the food. Do, do we have that type of follow-up? Well, let's not ask that question about our monitoring systems no. in Australia. Yeah, they're, not, they're, not, they're not very good. Uh, no, we, we no. Might, get, might start getting defamatory if we start talking <laughs> yeah. about, about I mean, food standards Australia and New Zealand. Yes. It's I mean, not exactly the, the world's most The issue most with, with that is that it's not clear who's right. responsible for monitoring and enforcing. Well, there's no penalties. And the, in the States, the people who are responsible for, to some extent, for monitoring and enforcing are the ver at the very bottom of the pile, and they, the, in terms of environmental health officers. If you're going to have, if you're going to have things that need to be enforced, then they need a penalty. Yes. And that penalty needs to be able to be applied occasionally, but just yes. look and see how fast the C runs away from things. As well as that, and so environmental on. health officers have a huge range of. Um, roles that they play That's in monitoring food, in monitoring water, in monitoring restaurants, in monitoring everything. And so they're going to prioritise what's most important. And you know, there, there's like one food. in every local council area. That's it. Mm. And so they, they're, yeah. they're going to respond to the things that, are, that they feel are pub real, really serious public health issues, like uh, a food contamination. And that's, and that's a sensible thing, but this is, that so actually no shows that we need to go into a systemic response to this sort of thing. We need to actually think do. systemically about what do we need, <laughs> and then we need to actually get politicians to say, well, we will fund what we need to do these particular things. Mm. They yeah. won't like it. Mm. No. But they already know they won't yeah. like it, which is why we don't get it, people. That's right. And also they don't have the training as well. You and know, they, so hate, they, they hate regulation. Uh, I'm, I'm roaming over a few things in yes. the small amount of time we have left. I just wanted to squeeze a few more issues in. Uh, D, celebrity chefs like uh, Heston Blumenthal and Jamie Oliver are now aligning themselves with the big supermarket brands in Australia. 
What do you think about this? How effective is this? Um, it's a lot of money they're paying. I think Jamie Oliver's, it's about $5 million or something, or it might even be more. Um, I reckon if you ask the average person on the street, it, does Jamie Oliver, is it Coles or Woolworths, they'd struggle to remember which one. But at least Jamie Oliver is a good fit with Woolworths in terms of branding, in terms of family value. Hester Blumen, whatever his name is, is a very weird one because he's a, he's a three-hatted chef and Coles is all about prices down, down. So in terms of branding fit, it's a very bizarre... Uh, very bizarre fit, but what they're trying to do is what they've done in England, which is sell the pre-packaged meals, and they're huge in England. Oh, and yeah. it was actually a campaign with Jamie Oliver through Sainsbury that did that. In Australia, we're still not there yet, thank God. We're still at least cooking a little bit of our own food still. <laughs> Whether that you know stays the same or not, the marketers are working very hard to make sure we don't actually cook our own food, despite all these um, master chefs and whatever. And while I've got you, uh, uh, the Self-Regulatory Advertising Standards Board found a few years ago that McDonald's Happy Meals, which come with toys, mm -hmm. did not foster pester power. Now, you've, yeah. got, you've got some, a young child yeah. or two. Uh, can you believe that? I could not believe it when it happened. I thought, that's absolute bullshit. They clearly don't have kids <laughs> because my kids pester me for those toys like you would not believe. Yes. And that's the whole point of them. They wouldn't have them there if the whole point of them is to make your kids <laughs> ask the parents to get them. You know, so, so yeah, sometimes, you know, self-regulatory self boards aren't always the best um, judges of things like that. Uh, and another interesting thing, Jim, you told me uh, is that it's not just the big takeaway food outlets that produce unhealthy food. Some of the most unhealthy foods are served at some of the fanciest, yes, most the expensive best restaurants. restaurants. Are you often full of fat and salt. salt. And, salt. you know, I always used to be really dubious about Stephanie in her kitchen yeah. gardens because I've been to her restaurant and the food's terrific. It really tastes great. She's a great yeah, chef. But it's not health food. But it's not healthy. Mm. And it's not supposed to be. There's that great story, I think you were telling me, about the Better Health Food Channel that got yes, arranged. The, the tell better, tell, tell the that story. Better Health Channel is, a, is a, um, an online food source or an online health source for Department of Health in Victoria. It's really worth going to have a look at, people. It's one of the most hit health food um, or health websites in the world. And we asked a number of celebrity chefs to prepare a healthy meal, a healthy, res um, healthy recipe for the channel, and then we got the public health nutritionist. We did, used to have one in Victoria. I don't think we do now. <laughs> I, think they, I think that position was abolished in one of our restructures because you don't need it. So we got the public health nutritionist to go and make the meals and analyse them. And none of them could be put on the Better Health Channel, not a single one. So when we went back to the celebrity chefs and said, look, can you amend your... No, I can't do that. You're interfering in my... You know, in my intellectual property, blah, 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 blah. I said, I'm not interfering in intellectual property. I just want healthy food on the, um, in, mm. that we can give to people that they can go to the, the website and go, oh, here's a fantastic restaurant. Jamie Oliver was the one good one. Mm. Mm. You know? uh, uh, Richard, when did, you're, a, you're a chef. When did you start cooking? How, how old were you when you were fiddling My around in the kitchen? My chefs. So, you yep. know, oh. I grew up there. Okay. Yeah. And um, what can we do to get... I mean, it seems to me there's this sort of food culture that exists up there, and yeah. then there's the ability of coming home on a Wednesday night and opening the fridge, presumably that it's got yep. a little bit of food in it, and just knowing how to cook a simple, basic, tasty meal with some Spartan ingredients in the cupboard and in the yeah. fridge. What can we do to get more of that Well, I think what you're happening? talking about, about whether or not restaurant meals should be healthier, but I think they're mutually exclusive. In actual fact, you know... I, my favourite food is the food someone's mum or grandma cooked. I think it's everybody's, you know. I'll go for the whistles and, you know, all the bangs and whistles at a restaurant, great, you know, and sometimes I like that. But really, the food that really talks to you, the stuff that comes in a bowl and... And it's probably... you probably disagree with me. But, you know, more healthy for you and more honest, mm. if you like. Mm. You know? Well, mm. let, let me give you a, a, a little anecdote. When I was the Director of Public Health and we were running anti-obesity campaigns, I tried to preempt the packaged meals thing because we could see what was happening in, Sains in Sainsbury's in the UK. So what I suggested that we do was actually do a deal with Coles and Woolworths where people could go online and say, you know, I'm a parent of three kids and there's two adults and three kids in my family and I need to cook something good tonight and you know, I need to be able to cook it for under ten dollars and all that sort of, you know, Curtis Stone's under ten dollars meals and all those sorts of things. 
and that you, could, you should be able to go online and, and up would pop a, re a recipe and it would be from one of the big supermarket chains who then, he D, this is an advert, this is a marketing opportunity for you. And then, um, but talk to me because I want to cut. And then, um, <laughs> and then what you do is you, they go online and they buy it like an Amazon book. They say, yeah, I want that. And then it says, come to the, come in, pay now and then call in at, at this on your way home, pick it up and it will take you 25 minutes to prepare that when you get home. And so people get given, get, they get sold fresh food and they take it home and they prepare it. Wasn't and there a... And their kids watch them prepare it. Do you? Wasn't there um, a book that came out that was massively popular and it was called something like Four Ingredients or Four yeah, Under yeah. $10 or something Everyone, came out yeah. about two years ago? Yeah, people are nodding. Uh, yeah. 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 So, well, so, so someone might have beaten you there. Sorry. No, Cole, <laughs> Coles had the under $10 meals for no, Curtis no, Stone. No, no, it was a they book didn't, that came out. But they this, didn't actually was... put it online and enable people to get it. I, mean, yeah, I think the problem with that was also it didn't actually work out to be under ten dollars when you added everything up because it assumed. Well, no, that's because they just assumed you would have all those wonderful yes. kitchen ingredients like in Richard has in his cupboards. <laughs> well, four ingredients isn't going to cut it, is it? Oh, you know? But I would say also we all have vanilla pods, don't we? Yeah, yes, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and a pinch of saffron. <laughs> I steal them from my chef children. That's the oh. way to get them. Diane, but have you got any, anything, to, anything to add to this getting, getting people cooking more? Well, and... um, I guess one, <laughs> one approach, well, ideally a healthy diet is one where we eat whole foods, not processed foods. Sure. We eat less meat, more vegetables, more cereals and grains and legumes, um, and low levels of sugar, yep. salt, and saturated fat. Well... There potentially could be a marketing opportunity around, I guess, selling foods in that form. And, and the idea of, you know, all right, this is a meal, these are the ingredients mm. that you need for it, here's the package of greens and, and other vegetables that you might need to. So instead of it helping being people to. Helping people mm. to put a meal together rapidly um, with. I guess minimal preparation. And I think we should be really careful about the myths because you know the myth about the processed food type thing. Some pro some foods should be processed because processing actually takes away the salmonellas and the bacteria and things. That too. That's why we have them. That's why we have. Yeah. That's where processing started. Cooking, <laughs> cooking is just a form of processing. Mm. I, I really pretty much have to wrap mm. this up, but I was going to get a final comment from you, D. You've got a book about to come out actually on political advertising, and the question I was going to leave you with was the political power of the food industry and the stranglehold they have over government to prevent some of the range of initiatives that we've been speaking about today from coming to fruition. Do they, for want of a better term, have governments by the short and curlies? Oh, hell yes. yes. The food lobbyists, they're, they're hugely powerful. I think the industry is worth in marketing terms, uh, could be wrong here, about $13 billion a year. It's massive. So then the influence they have over the government is massive and not always healthy. OK. I am going to have to wrap this uh, conversation. Uh, some fantastic tweets and fantastic suggestions. And yes, I am aware that there are a million things we didn't get to talk about in the hour that we had. But uh, I hope it's been an enjoyable conversation for you. Can you please thank our fantastic panel of guests today? I can't really believe oh that is an hour that is gone in the blink of an eye and we've hardly covered anything. But look, thanks for coming along tonight to this uh, final Goma Talks harvest. <laughs> and uh, bye, bye, Dee. Um, uh, and thanks for taking part in the Twitter uh, conversation. I do a lot of these events. I've never seen Twitter go so crazy. So what a... What a thoroughly modern audience you are. I'd like to thank the guests. Uh, tonight's Goma Talks will be available online at the Quagoma TV website through the Galleries website. It'll be broadcast on RN. Tell your friends who couldn't be here tonight on Monday the 11th. I'm Paul Barclay from ABCRN. Thank you and good night. <laughs> <laughs>